My name is Linda, your moderator for today's Zone 7 Gardening Conversation on planting spring bulbs in the fall. Thank you for joining us today. The Zone 7 Gardening Series of Plant Clinics is sponsored by the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. Staffing our plant clinics are master gardeners from Fairfax County Master Gardeners. Master gardeners share science-based information about gardening and horticulture topics. Fall is the best time of year to plant bulbs for an early spring garden because the bulbs need to undergo a period of chilling in order to bloom. So today we will be talking with our gardeners, Elizabeth and Sonia, who will share with us how to grow and care for our spring bulbs and our zone seven gardens. Before our conversation with Elizabeth and Sonia, we will have our guest gardener, Kathleen, share with us how to divide and transplant daylilies. Before we turn to our main presentation on planting spring bulbs with Elizabeth and Sonia, our guest gardener, Kathleen, is going to describe a fall path, how to divide and transplant daylilies. Over to you, Kathleen. Thank you, Linda. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to talking about dividing and transplanting daylilies. Here are a couple pictures of some daylilies that have been growing in my yard for several years. The daylily is a perennial. It loves full sun. It's easy to care for and generally disease resistant, which adds to its popularity. And it comes in many different uh, flower colors and sizes. The Stella de Oro lily is popular in this area and it's a particularly small daylily growing only about 18 inches tall. Other daylilies grow about three feet or more tall. Some daylilies have evergreen or even semi-evergreen foliage, and there are reblooming daylilies. The reason it's called a daylily, the botanical name is hemerocallis. The reason it's called a daylily is because each blossom lasts just a day, but on each blooming scape, there's usually several buds, so you do get an extended bloom season. Day daylilies look great in clumps or mass plantings and can even be used on slopes to control erosion. So it's really a great flower, flowering plant. So Kathleen, how do we start dividing our daylilies? You're going to need equipment to do so. A spade or a large fork, a sharp knife and a weeding tool can come in handy, as well as your garden hose. We need to remember that daylilies have fleshy roots and you wanna keep those roots intact as much as, as possible. When you're dividing, Try to create divisions that have three to five vigorous shoot, shoots and a healthy supply of roots because it's really the roots that are going to make the plant come back once you've divided. It's best to divide daylilies when it's not too dry and after the blooms have faded. So late summer to early fall is generally the best time to divide daylilies. If it's been dry like it has lately, you might want to water your plants the day before you plan to do your division so that the soil won't be so dry. Trim the foliage back about, leaving about eight to 12 inches above ground. And you wanna transplant them four to six weeks before the ground freezes or before we have a really hard frost here in Virginia. Using your spade or fork, you wanna dig out the root ball and you do need to go deep, especially for the larger varieties. Their roots do go deep. Circle, dig your circle around that root ball about eight inches out from the foliage. Lift the root ball out of the hole and I have sometimes been able to use my gloved hands to pull that root ball out once I get it loose but honestly with our heavy Virginia clay I often need to use my spade to kind of leverage it out of that hole. Um, once it's out then you want to try to get as much soil away from those roots as possible so you can see what you've got. The water hose, a spray from the water hose may help clear that soil at this point. To divide, look for spaces between those fans, spaces that create a possible natural division, and then you can uh, 
with either with your hands or with your weeding tool, kind of push those roots apart. Honestly, when I've uh, divided daylilies, I usually have such a heavy clump in the center that I've resorted to using the knife simply to cut through that mm -hmm. crown and, and create two or three divisions out of a one, one big heavy crown of daylilies. Okay, some parts of the plant, of course, may be lost or broken in this process. A shoot without roots is not gonna grow. So that at that point becomes trash. But if you've got roots that have lost their shoots, <laughs> that most likely will grow. So that's worth replanting. Okay, it's really up to the gardener how many fans you keep in a clump. You can get it down to single fans if they're not too tightly packed or two to three sprouts in one fan or in one collection, in one group, or maybe even five or more. So if you have a lot of fans in the division, it's you may have to, again, divide more quickly. The average time between digging and dividing is usually three to five years with most daylilies. Okay, I think at this point, we're ready for talking about transplanting or replanting the division. Right. Thank you, Kathleen. So yeah, now we're ready to divide our daylilies. We've divided our daylilies, day day so now we're ready to transplant. Exactly. Okay. I'd love, thank you. The next slide is helpful here. Okay. Obviously, you need to prepare your soil bed. And as I mentioned, daylilies like six hours of sun a day. You may wanna consider a spot though, where you get some afternoon shade because especially the darker colors, like your purples and reds, they're not color fast. And if they're in full sun throughout the entire day, through the afternoon hours, they may fade. So that's one consideration as you choose where to replant your daylilies. So after amending your soil, you wanna dig a hole that's about twice as wide and deep as the root ball and let's consider root placement. One uh, source that I read recommended, as is very common, to kind of create a mound of soil inside the hole because the roots, you don't want the roots either flat out, parallel with the surface of the soil, nor do you want them totally vertical. Uh, you wanna kind of spread them at a 45 degree angle. So this little mound of dirt you create in the hole is where you can spread the roots around um, to get them well placed. And you do want the crown, that is the part where the roots and the leaves come together. It's usually white or kind of yellow. You do want that crown about one inch below the top of the soil. And of course, once you get the plant placed in the hole, you know, bring the soil back over it and tamp it down so that you get good soil, you get good uh, soil root contact. You don't want a lot of air in there underneath the ground. And of course you do need to water. And they recommend watering uh, for several weeks, especially if it's dry. So Kathleen, how often should we divide the daylilies? Usually about every three to five years, daylilies need to be divided. You'll know if the flowering starts to decline. If you've got just those beautiful strappy leaves, but few flower scapes, um, you'll know that your daylily is getting too clouded and does need to be divided at that point. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, are there any references that you'd like to share with our folks online? Well, there's lots of information out there. It was almost hard to narrow it down. Um, the Minnesota Extension Service had a good publication specifically on dividing perennials in general. It wasn't specific to daylilies. Um, this Rose Hill Gardeners in Kansas City, they had a good video on dividing daylilies, but I could tell by the quality of the soil they were working with, it wasn't Virginia. <laughs> it was good quality Midwestern loam <laughs> and easy to get off those roots. So it's a bit different sometimes working with a compacted clay here in Virginia. 
All right. Well, thank you, Kathleen. This is a great step-by-step -step information. My, de my day lilies definitely need to be divided and transplanted. So now I know how, and thanks for sharing. Oh, I'll make one final point. It is possible to divide them in the spring. And of course, if you do that, you want to do that before the foliage gets very tall. And obviously, do not cut the foliage off if you're dividing in the spring. That's only in the fall. So it's, it's better to do it in the fall and then you do trim the foliage and it's best to do it after the plant has flowered and is finished flowering. Thanks for that tidbit. Thank you again. So good afternoon, Elizabeth. Thank you for starting our conversation on planting spring bulbs. <clears throat> what are some general guidelines on planting bulbs? Thank you, I'm glad to be here. A bulb is a flower that can travel anywhere because it carries its own suitcase. <clears throat> and botanically, bulbs are known as herbaceous geophytes because they store the nourishment for their life cycle within the bulb. You can buy bulbs just about any time starting in the summer. Often you find them in gift shops and it's okay to buy them then, but keep them dry and cool until planting time. Sometimes people will store them in the refrigerator in a double bag. The important thing about refrigeration, however, is to make sure you, you keep them away from fruit like apples, because apples give off something called polyethylene gas that will um, begin to deteriorate your bulbs. Um, discard any soft or squish, squishy bulbs before you, you plant. With bulbs, you want to remember the 50-14 rule. You plant when the ground temperature is 50 degrees or cooler, when bulbs will have a period of dormancy for about 14 weeks. Plant with the roots side down, pointed top up, and at a depth three times the height of the bulb, or according to uh, directions. <coughs> plant in a sunny, dry, loamy, but well-drained soil. Remember, bulbs do not like to be wet. Add organic matter at the bottom of the hole. And when your bulbs begin to flower, you can add some fertilizer. One very good um, piece of advice is to maintain a diagram of bulb planting for reference use from year to year, and then document the bloom times before you add new bulb additions. Great advice. And I hadn't heard of that 50-14 rule before. Elizabeth, could you share some background on the first spring flowers that you will be discussing today? Well, um, we're going to be talking about daffodils, hyacinths, and tulips. And so um, one of the oldest cultivated bulbs is the daffodil with over 40 known species native to Europe, North Africa, Western Asia, and the Mediterranean. There are 12 divisions of Narcissus, which is the botanical name for daffodils. And they have many different characteristics based on the size and shape of the trumpet. They come in a wide variety of colors, ranging from white, yellow, orange, and bicolored with orange and pink. And you can see I gave you, I gave you some examples of a very white daffodil, and then of course a bicolored one that is yellow and orange. Great, those are beautiful. Elizabeth, what are the ideal growing conditions when planting daffodils? Well, daffodils are, are very long-lived in the landscape. They grow well in our region and will multiply over time, forming a large mass of beautiful color. And I think you've seen fields and fields of daffodils. They need good drainage, loamy soil and grow best in full sun. If there's too little sun, the bulbs will produce foliage, but no blooms. Plant them about six feet deep, I mean six inches, excuse me, deep with four to six inches between the bulbs, and then top dress them with <clears throat> 5 10, 10 fertilizer when the leaf tips emerge. Elizabeth, once we planted our daffodils, how should we care for them until they bloom? Daffodils, daffodils need lots of water while they're growing. Water immediately after you plant them and keep them moist until the fall rains start. Continue watering for three weeks or so after they bloom and then stop watering. Your daffodils should continue to bloom for three to five years. 
And if they stop blooming, then you need to replant in a new location. Elizabeth, how should we care for our daffodils after they bloom? Okay, now, um, it seems to me that most of us just plant our bulbs and let them stay. But what I found from the daffodil, American Daffodil Society is they recommend that after blooming, you wait for the foliage to turn yellow, usually late May or June, and then um, dig them up, wash the bulbs thoroughly, let them dry completely, and store in a dry place in an onion bag or maybe even pantyhose in some place where you'll have good air circulation to keep them dry. Well, I don't know that any of us do this, but that's what the Daffodil Society recommends that you do. All right. Elizabeth, what are some suggested landscape views? Um, daffodils do well in hillsides and raised beds as best locations. Daffodils are toxic to deer, small mammals, and squirrels. They're ideal for containers with a, recommended, with a recommendation for two gallon pots where you would use three to four bulbs per container. If you're going to containerize daffodils, put, use a special potting mixture of one pipe part perlite to three parts of sterilized soil. Water heavily for the first week after planting. And they can be um, forced for early blooming in containers. Great information. What are some cultivars and varieties of daffodils? Now this was very, this was a huge challenge because <laughs> there was so many pictures, especially from the American Daffodil Society. I had a hard time picking and choosing which ones to show you. So I'd really recommend that you go to the American Daffodil Society uh, website and take a look and see what, what you can find. The photos are outstanding. And so I have from left to right, American Dream, and then Pacific Rim, and then Rose Garden, which is the double, which is quite spectacular. All right, great, those are beautiful. Elizabeth, could you share with us some background information on the next flower you will be sharing with us today? Okay, the next one is hyacinths or Hyacinthus orientalis. And they originate from Eurasia, the Mediterranean area, and South Turkey. They are perennial with fragrant spring flowers, single flowers that grow on an erect stalk. They bloom in mid-spring with each bulb producing one flower. And a hyacinths do produce fewer flowers each year after the first year. Hmm, that's interesting. Elizabeth, how should we care for our hyacinths? Grow in rich, well-drained soil in full sunshine. Plant in full sun, three to six inches apart, and approximately four to six inches deep. Keep the soil moist after planting to encourage root growth, growth, but stop watering during the dormancy period. So you would put your, your bulbs into the soil, water them for a while, and then stop so that they can be completely dormant for at least 14 weeks. After blooming, remove the flower spikes so the plants do not, to, do not need to expend energy on seed production. Elizabeth, what are some landscape uses? Uh, hyacinths are good for drought tolerant gardens or rock gardens. They're good for borders, mass plantings, or small groups. And if you're going to do a border, you might want to try a grape hyacinth variety because they um, really don't grow quite as tall. They, they stay close to the ground and make a very nice border. Um, the, the bulbs, the hyacinth bulbs are commonly grown in containers. And quite often they are forced for indoor winter bloom. I'm sure you have seen them in the, in the supermarkets coming about the beginning of, of March. Uh, as you know, the flowers are pungently sweet, pungently sweet, and they are marketed as a natural plant deodorizer for the home kitchen. However, the perfume scent can be very troublesome for people with asthma. So keep that in mind as you're choosing to have hyacinths. I once gave them for a gift one time and the poor lady had to put them outside because the smell was so, <laughs> so pungent. They are, they are strong. Elizabeth, what are some hyacinth varieties? Well, now they say hyacinths are the patriotic flowers because they come in red, white, and blue. And uh, they are also available in purple, pink, red, 
and um, many other colors. Um, I am showing you now white pearl and a, a smaller cultivar that's not quite so tall called blue jacket. Elizabeth, could you provide some background information on tulips? Now, when I started doing research on tulips, I was overwhelmed by how much information there, out, there is out there and lots of history. Um, tulips are most, uh, so, most often associated with the Netherlands and they have a big, huge uh, festival there called the Floriad. Actually, it's not, it's not annually, it's every four years, but it's, it's um, acres and acres of tulips planted in the Netherlands. Uh, tulips originated in Southern Europe and Asia and they were involved in the stock market crash in the mid 1600s known as tulip mania, which I found to be interesting. Um, tulip flowers are edible and tulip bulbs were, were reported to be cooked and eaten during times of war and starvation. And I've had people tell me that's how they survived the second world war was they had tulip bulbs they could eat. Um, they bloom in mid to late spring, usually well after the early spring bulbs. Um, with flowers in or that are solid or mixed colors, they're all colors available ex except true blue. They grow in height from four tenths of an inch to two feet four inches and in width from six tenths of an inch to nine tenths of an inch. The flowers are one to three inches in width. They're solitary, erect, and cup shaped. Lots of great historical information. I really didn't know that tulips, flowers and bulbs were edible. I guess that's why the deer enjoy them so much. That's right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, how do you care for the tulips during and after they bloom? Well, you grow in rich, medium, moisture, well-drained soil in full sun. They're best grown in areas with cool, moist winters and warm, dry summers. You plant them four to six inches deep two to five inches apart. And if you're planting in clay soil, plant them less deep because it's very hard for their roots to get through the clay soil to begin a new, um, to keep them steady. You remove the spent flower stems after, after bloom to prevent seeding. And you let them, you let the foliage stay on the plants until it yellows. They, uh, tulips rarely rebloom after a second year because most of them are hybrid varieties, which are, which are hardier and they perf perform better than the perennials. So most people grow them as annuals. They either just leave them in the soil or they dig them up. When I worked in Crystal City, we had um, uh, sidewalk, sidewalks lined with tulips. And at the end of the growing season, the building administrator would tell us to bring our shovels and dig them up. So we did, we would go dig up all the, the uh, tulips that have been growing along the sidewalks. Elizabeth, what are some landscape uses of tulips? Well, mostly the most beautiful, of course, are big, huge fields of tulips, but they're used in cutting gardens and you'll, you'll see people who cut tulips for their indoor, indoor arrangements. They're also used in borders and in mass plantings. They can cause contact dermatitis. They're toxic to cats, dogs, and horses. Unfortunately, they're not toxic to deer. Deer love tulips beyond belief. They can be grown in containers following uh, general planting gui guidelines with two gallon containers and specialized potting soil. Elizabeth, what are some cultivar varieties of, of tulips? Now this is, this is wonderful because you can find so many tulip varieties. And what I did was I just tried to choose some general categories um, the first on the left is called Tulipa fosteriana, and it gives you the usual tall tulips, and you can see the shape. The one in the middle is called Tulip Greggi, Greggi, I guess, and it's, it is a two-inch tulip. It, it grows very close to the ground. And then the one on the far right is called Miranda Double Late, which is a double tulip. There are also tulips, uh, parrot tulips, which have beautiful lacy edges but I didn't include one uh, for you to see today, just the double. Those are beautiful examples. Here's Elizabeth's references. Um, are there any references that you'd like to point out to the folks online? 
Well, the very last references, um, people know that people know from my other presentations that I have a real, um, a real, uh, I really enjoy the Clemson Cooperative Extension Home and Garden Center. I find so much information there that's useful. And I, it's, it's one of the ones I go to first whenever I'm trying to research anything. But the very last reference has now turned out to be my absolute favorite. Is that on the next page, uh, it's, Elizabeth? It's down, it's the last slide down if you wanna just get down there. Okay. And it's the North Carolina Extension Gardener plant. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's the, it's the plant. Um, they have a toolbox. Right. Yeah. It's the plant, it's the plant toolbox. That's what yeah. it's called. And yeah. it's from North Carolina State University. And uh, these um, this is interesting because it has just about any plant or shrub that you would be interested in. And it has everything you could possibly want to know about them. It's very complete, it's very thorough. So I recommend going to the North Carolina Extension Plant uh, Gardener plant toolbox as a starting place for just about anything you'd want to know. I, I recommend them as well. They're a great source. All right. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing the characteristics and growing conditions of daffodils, hyacinths, and tulips. Sonia, welcome to our conversation, and thank you for joining us as we continue our discussion on alum, snowdrop, aconite. Sonia, could you share with us some background information on alum, this native flower. Yes, so allium is, it's an ornamental onion and there's over the, um, it's uh, the genus of the family name Amaryllidaceae. There's over 700 species of allium that include the uh, edible ones that we all know about, onions and garlic. Um, they are native to North America and, and in many places around the world. They tend to grow in dry mountainous regions. Uh, you can see the photos that I put on this slide. Actually, I thought it was interesting. The top slide is, is ornamental. It's the gigantum. And the bottom one is actually, it's an, it's an edible onion flower. I thought it would just be interesting to sort of understand that the, how they are related to each other. They do have very similar looking flowers. Um, the other thing that I found interesting is when you actually handle the ornamental onion plants, you might get a, a smell of onion or garlic when you handle it. Um, you plant them in the fall for spring blooming, and then you know the, fol the foliage will die back after blooming. Uh, and just sort of disappear. They require full sun and they thrive in well-drained soil. They're drought tolerant. And because of the smell, they are deer resistant and rodent resistant. Great information. Sonia, what are some characteristics? Well, they're relatively pest-free plants, which is really great, um, including from deer and rodents. Uh, they are very attractive to pollinators. Um, and they don't do well in overly damp conditions. That, that if they're in overly damp conditions, the bulbs will be susceptible to fungal disease, but otherwise they, they are quite uh, disease-free. Um, you know, you plant, they, they spread over the years. So at some point, if the clumps get too big, you can just dig them up and divide the clumps in the, you know, in the spring before they start to grow. All right, uh, Sonia, could you share some examples? Sure. So the one that I think everybody's seen in the magazines is Allium gigantum because they can be up to five feet tall and there's always a picture in the magazine of the little kid standing next to the flower that's bigger than they are, that's, that's Allium. This one, it naturalizes in the garden. Its hardiness zone is from five to nine. And it, I mean, it's eye-catching. It's absolutely spectacular and drifts. Um, and Sonia, it's, go ahead. Are there other examples that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, it seems to be that they grow all around the world and there's every version of tall and short you can come up with in several colors. But the other one, this one is interesting because it's native to Western, the Western US and Canada. It's Allium 
acuminidum, also known as tape, taper tip onions or hooker's onions. These are about 20 inches tall. The flowers are, they're not as compact and full. The bulbs, the flow, flowers, they're more spread out, pink to purple flowers. Very pretty. Could you share some additional information on share on share some background information on snowdrops? Sure, snowdrops, um, also called galanthus, um, they're a very early blooming spring bulb. Uh, the The name comes from the from Greek, where gala means milk and anthos means flower. So the actual common name, which nobody uses, is milk flower. The snowdrops are native to the woods and wet alpine grasslands in southern Europe. Um, and historically, they were used quite a quite a bit for folk remedies for just about anything that you could imagine they were a remedy for. <laughs> what are some characteristics of this early blooming perennial? So they're, they're small in stature from four to 10 inches tall. They bloom very early, even um, they'll come up through the snow in some places. They, they like the cool zones, you know, zone three to seven. You want to, you know, it sounds like what Elizabeth said about waiting until the, the soil is 50 degrees. It's probably the case for these, particularly they, they you want to wait until the soil is cooled before you, you plant them. They like full sun during the spring. Um, an ideal situation would be to plant them under deciduous trees because they'll actually bloom before the leaves come out. They prefer rich, well-drained soil. And um, as I said, they're diminutive in stature. So a great place to put them would be uh, in a flower at the front of the flower bed, you know, in rock gardens, sort of where you want to see hopes of spring, you know, where you could, where, you know, you don't want it hiding in the back of the garden, but sort of in the front where you can get a hint of the joy that is coming our way. They're, they're very, uh, great as far as they have very few pests and diseases. They're also deer and rodent resistant. Little Maybe plant. that milky substance keeps them away. Maybe the deer don't even realize they're there. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some, uh, what are a couple of cultivars that you would like to share with us today? Sure, so um, there weren't a lot, you know, they tend to just, they tend to be white and diminutive, but there is this one from the Majoria Botanical Garden. This um, Galanthus nivalis floriplano has, um, it's white, but it has the doubled petals. And that one's good in zone three to seven. Blooms from, blooms from February to March. There was several cultivars that don't bloom in our zone, so I didn't add them. And then the other one, this Sam Arnott, is a bit larger and has larger flowers. Uh, that was what was unique about that one. All right, thanks for sharing. Sonia, what are some characteristics of winter aconite? So here's a picture of winter aconite in the summer when you don't see the blooms. This little character is native to Southern France and Bulgaria, uh, good in zone three to seven, also diminutive, a height of three to six inches and a width of three to six inches. Um, good in full, full sun to part shade, also one of the earliest bloomers, um, very low maintenance plant, but you don't want it, to, but it's in one sense, it's low maintenance. So you don't have to do much to it, but on the other, other sense, once it's established, you don't want to touch it. And I think I have a picture. It's there, yeah. the flowers are yellow. Yeah, that's the next slide. So yeah. Here's some, here's a, this, what are some good um, choices to plant these, these flowers? where to plant them. It's a, it's very much like the snowdrops. You want to plant them somewhere where when you're going out in the kind of ugly bits of spring, you see a little shock of, of yellow, you know. Just like the other plants, they're relatively disease and pest resistant and deer and rodents don't like them. They're also great in rock gardens. Again, they're little, so you, you know, you want to put them in a place where they're not going to get overwhelmed. Um, they will be peeking out of the snow. And um, I have to say, like I looked, I looked far and wide for cultivars, 
and they they there was only one man a british man with a blog who who had cultivars and i didn't really think i could quote him but basically I, they're not um the darlings of the plant world and i guess that's why there aren't a lot of cultivars, they're yellow. You know, there might be lighter shades of yellow or darker shades of yellow. There might be some um, double petals, but they're not, um, you know, there wasn't, there was very little to see when I tried to find cultivars. They were really just said winter aconite. Well, but they're both like um, nice uh, early, you know, signals that spring are, you know, coming. Yeah. So that's, that's good, so. So here are Sonia's references. Are there any that, uh, references that you would like to point out to the folks online? Well, I think the Pacific Bulb Society was very interesting. I mean, they had a, a very, very many allium um, varieties and they talked a lot about native to different parts of the world. And besides that, I think that um, the Missouri uh, the Missouri one, the Allium Create Landscape Interest, that one was very useful. The Missouri Botanical just has a lot of information. So that one was really good. All right. I think I have all your references. Yep, those yeah. are it. Okay, all right, great. All right. So uh, thank you, Elizabeth and Sonia for all that great information on these spring blooming flowers. It'll soon be time to get out there and plant them based on the 5014 rule. Um, okay, now let's turn to questions submitted during registration. Belinda, are you online? If so, please uh, unmute. All right, Belinda asked the first question today, when should I cut back and divide daylilies and iris. And so Kathleen, could you answer this question for Belinda? Sure, certainly. Um, first of all, it's best to cut back and divide your daylilies when they have finished their blooming. So no point in cutting those beautiful flowers. Um, and as indicated here, if it's dry like it's been, it's wise to water the daylilies the day or so before you're gonna actually do the division. If you get out there when it's cloudy and not bright sun, that'll be helpful because it will prevent the roots from drying out while, while you're actually doing the process. All right, great information. Let's turn oh, to- it, One last thought. And if you happen to be watching the forecast, if you can actually do the dig up and division and replanting when there's rain in the forecast, you'll have less watering that you need to do the first week or so. All right, great tip there. So, all right, um, let's turn to our last question. And that's from Rohina. Are, are you online? If so, could you unmute your mic? All right, the question was, what are deer resistant varieties? And so we assumed that you were talking about spring bulbs. And Elizabeth, could you answer this question? Well, daffodils and hyacinths are very toxic to deer. Uh, but as Linda told me, her deer ate the, ate the hyacinths to the ground. So they're supposed to be toxic, but maybe they aren't. But unlike daffodils and hyacinths, deer love tulips. And um, if you're going to plant tulips, you need to be thinking about what you're going to do about the deer. The best thing to do is to plant some daffodils in the tulip gardens to keep the deer away. And there are a few varieties of tulips that are totally deer resistant. Uh, tulip acuminata, tu tulip biflora, tulip calpacostana, calpacostana, and tulip de stem based on. And these are um, reportedly very deer resistant. The deer won't eat them at all. And there is a very good website on tulips and deer resistant varieties. And we have um, included the URL for that site. Hello. Can I just pipe in because I will share that daylilies 
are not deer resistant. As a matter <laughs> of fact, they're, that is true. They're, they're quite edible, and in Asian cooking, like Chinese, they actually use bay lily blossoms, I believe, and parts of the flower in, in cooking. Um, and I've had the unfortunate experience of having planted new day lilies in my garden and anxiously awaiting to see what the flowers are going to look like, only to have the deer come through overnight and eat those buds. So I had to wait another year before I saw my flowers. So. <laughs> That's funny. And then the last thing on this slide, as Sonia had mentioned, alum snowdrops in winter aconite, those are uh, deer resistant. And I'm gonna have to check out that website that Elizabeth said, because uh, I don't have any tulips because I have herds of deer around my yard. So I'll be checking that out. So, all right. Um, let's turn to any questions in the chat. Susan, do we have any questions in the chat? Uh, no questions in the chat today. Okay. Kathleen did share that uh, she has garlic chives in her garden and every September it puts out white flowers similar to Allium and now she knows why. So the information was very helpful. All right, great, great. We always learn things. So thank you, Kathleen, Elizabeth, Sonia, and Susan. So 